Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Gone Beyond Grim panel, where we talk about fairy tales and fantasy and why we're drawn to those kinds of books and why we write those kinds of books. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and talk about the book uh, that they're promoting today. Uh, so let's start with um, how I see you on my screen, Alexandra Bracken. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm prepared for once. So I have my books right here. Um, Perfect. So I'm Alex Bracken. I'm the author of a number of books, including the Darkest Mind series. Uh, the books I'm going to be talking about today, mostly lore, which is, oh, there we go. I always turn it the wrong way. Um, <laughs> it's a contemporary fantasy set in New York City that uses Greek mythology and it involves um, hunting gods to steal their power and immortality. And then this is a graphic novel adaptation of my debut novel. It's about a wizard and a skilled weaver who have to travel across their country and face, you know, dark magic to stop an impending war. So those are the two I'll talk about today. Yay. JL, would you like to go? Hi. I am JL, the author of Wings of Ebony. And it is a young adult urban fantasy novel about a black teen from an inner city community who is um, who has to lean into her ancestors' magic to protect her community from drugs, violence, and crime. It's so good. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Alex. Yay. Um, Lynette Noni, do you want to go? Hi, everyone. I am Lynette Noni. I'm the author of The Prison Hero. Um, someone recently described it as, and I'm stealing this, um, they called it The Hunger Games, but set in a prison with magic royals and rebels. And I feel like I can't come up with a better tagline for myself. So I'm going with that. <laughs> nice. Um, Mike Johnston, you want to go? <laughs> Hello, uh, Mike Johnston. This is my book, Confessions of a Dork Lord. Um, it's a humorous um, middle grade comedy about a kid and his friends. And he's sort of like, Sort of like what would happen if you were the son of like Sauron or Voldemort, um, you know, that, you know, problems ensue. Um, <laughs> that's it. Uh, and Namina Forna, would you like to introduce yourself in your book? Hi, everyone. My name is Namina Forna. Uh, my book is, okay, I, I got the right shoulder. It's The Gilded Ones. Um, I, it's a young adult fantasy novel. I always like to describe it as if the Dora Malahi from Black Panther were in the world um, of The Handmaid's Tale and said, burn everything down. Um, so basically my book is set in a super patriarchal world where there's a group of girls who are considered demons because they're faster and stronger than regular people and they bleed gold. But then actual demons come into this world uh, and humans are like, wait a second, we need these girls to kill these monsters and hopefully they'll kill each other off. And so they offer the girls a choice, fight or die. My main character, Deka, decides to fight and in doing so goes on an adventure that changes her life. Amazing, I love that. And I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. I'm gonna get it right. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, oh, I'm here because of a uh, high school musical, the musical, the series, The Road Trip. Not a fantasy novel, but uh, the book I'm promoting at Galwes. <laughs> so, uh, High School Musical, the musical, the series is sort of like a fantasy <laughs> where you go back to the Wildcats days. Um, but I have also written fantasy books, so those are in the back there. So, what did I wanted to ask you guys today is what is a fantasy novel or fairy tale that inspired you to write this book? Um, and uh, we can start with uh, Lynette. Ooh, I wouldn't actually say there's any book that inspired this book. Um, I hadn't read a young adult fantasy set in a prison. Um, I did actually, a while before I started writing this book, I read uh, The Tattooist of Auschwitz by Heather, well, written by Heather Morris. And um, and uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if there's a massive like link in my mind, but I do know that when I read that book, I just really felt transported there and it was just so horrific and just, um, it just really evoked so many emotions in me. Um, and so um, I guess if I had to, like if I had to pick a book on the spot that maybe 
inspired that, it would be, I'd probably choose that. Nice. Alex, want to go? Oh, you're muted. Hey, mute. <laughs> it's okay. Stop. Sorry, I was like trying to be <laughs> good and just <laughs> completely forgot how this whole thing works. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry guys. Um, so with lore, I didn't want to do a straightforward retelling of any one myth. I knew I kind of wanted to try my hand at writing what a Greek myth might feel like in the modern world. So taking all of the darkness, taking all of the really big epic stakes and bringing that to a big epic city like New York City. And so in lore, there are a bunch of different references, um, both like very notable references, but also, you know, some Easter eggs if you are really into Greek mythology. But the book that um, inspired my love of Greek mythology was Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths. I feel like it's a book that everybody has on their shelves. I just realized I used it to prop up big lore, so I cannot oh, display nice. that and as a show and tell, but my copy is super beat up and my mom gave it to me, you know, as a way to kind of start talking about the Greek heritage on her side of the family mm -hmm. and start, you know, kind of introducing us to that whole world. And it just has always stuck that. with me and I've always loved the myth sense. Um, what about you, Jay? Um, I think similar to Lynette, um, I hadn't seen anything like my book before, but it, there definitely were books that I've read that have influenced sort of the evolution of the story in my mind and just sort of the sort of the mood and tone I wanted the, the story to evoke. So mm -hmm. I think of uh, The Hate You Give for sure. I, it was sort of the first time that I saw um, a main character that reminded me of my home, a, a home that reminded me of my home. And it was sort of the first time well into my adulthood that I was like, whoa, books about my home can exist? Okay, like, okay, I have some ideas then. Um, and so I would say that coupled with uh, Black Panther and Wonder Woman, the movies, I haven't seen, I always have to qualify this. I haven't seen the 1984. So when I say Wonder Woman, I am referring to the 2012 one, just to clear, because <laughs> I keep hearing things about the recent one. Anyway, but um, yeah, I think the combination of those, there was just this sort of, you know, very powerful feminist -y angle of these of these stories and, and those, uh, Wonder Woman, while I love it, it, it definitely centered a, a, a white woman. And so I wanted, and, and then I remember the feeling of Black Panther and just like being steeped in Wakanda. I just wanted to create a story that sort of gave me the feeling that I had when I finished watching um, Black Panther, that level of seamness with, with the badassness of, of Wonder Woman. And then of course, centering my community like, like Angie does so well in Thug, so. That's so awesome. Yay. Uh, and Namina, do you want to tell um, us what is your name? So um, there wasn't um, actually a specific myth that inspired the Gilded Ones. Um, it was mainly, I think, inspired by just like growing up in Sierra Leone, West Africa and going to Spelman College, which is all female and all black. Um, I, When I approached the book, I really wanted to tell a story um, that explained what it meant to live in a patriarchal society. What does a society like that look like? Who suffers? Who does it? And so I sort of came um, at it from that point. But I will say that some um, one thing that did sort of uh, have an influence was when I was originally writing the book, um, I loved the movie 300. Um, but I would never seen a movie like that where it was a group of women kicking butt and taking names. So I sort of went into the book really, really wanting to see that and also to see it um, in an African setting because I grew up in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And I always had this idea in my mind of um, the entire continent of Africa as being this um, magical, um, this magical and wonderful place. And so I wanted to put all those sort of things into the book. Awesome. And Mike, can you tell um, us what inspired the Dork Lord? <laughs> I can. Um, uh, so my book, Convention of Dork Lord, um, it's, it's kind of about like a lot of classic fantasy books that some of us may have or may not have read. It's, it's got, I mean, certainly it, it touches on like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. And, you know, I, I wanted to, I love all those books, but, you know, they're, 
they're all kind of the same, let's be honest. Um, and you get sort of tired of these things after a while. Um, so I wanted to write about a kid who was sort of an anti-hero in that he's not really good at magic or quests or successful in any of these things. Like, I wanted to write, you know, kind of like a real kid who's like, you know, just terrible at everything. And, you know, he doesn't like learn a lot in the book or he's not success, particularly successful at any point, you know, ever. And, you know, it's, it's middle grade comedy, so that works fine. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I wanted I wanted a real sort of anti-hero, so I made him the son of the Dark Lord who's, you know, he's kind of like afraid of fire, and he's allergic to smoke, and just the whole thing isn't working for him at all. Um, so uh, it's a little bit of a kind of a postmodern take on the, the classic, you know, Lord of the Rings hero kid. So um, I was going to do Hogwarts houses, but I thought since we're fantasy, I would do Lord of the Rings, like, are you guys elf, human, hobbit, dwarf, dark lord, orc, wizard, <laughs> and maybe why? <laughs> and is a uh, is your book, uh, you know, uh, how does it embody the trait of, let's say, a hobbit <laughs> or a dwarf <laughs> or an orc? <laughs> does anybody want to take a stab at this very silly question? <laughs> I can go first. I am, despite my, you know, I'm 5'10", I'm very tall, um, despite my height, I am very hobbit-like in nature in that I love to eat. I also engage with second breakfast frequently. Um, I love the comforts of home. I like to be out in my garden, just walking around as much of a garden I, as I can have in Arizona. Um, so I'm very like hobbit-like, kind of like my little bubble. But it's funny because I would say lore is more of like, um, more of the ranger type, more of the strider, mm -hmm. argon type, I think, maybe. I don't know. Awesome. And if Lord of the Rings doesn't work, we can use other fantasy tropes. <laughs> yeah, I, does anyone want to fess up to being a dark lord at heart? Um, I, I will fess up to being a wizard. Um, <laughs> if, uh, in, like if I was in a fantasy, if I was in a fantasy world, I would be a wizard. I would live in my tower and never go out. And I would send um, I would send heroes on quests, knowing full well that they're gonna die. And I'd be like, "Oh, nice. that's not gonna survive." All of a sudden, and I'd be like, "Yes, you have all the chances of survival. Go, brave hero!" But inside, I'm like, "This one's gonna die. It's fine. It's fine. We'll have another." Um, kind of like being an author, right? I mean, you know. Yeah. Kind I of. Which is statistically, because, <laughs> because like all the the um, the characters in my books, they're basically heroes. They're very, they're warrior types, and I send them off to die. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. Any more? Does anybody want to claim uh, elf, uh, dwarf? <laughs> I mean, mine I is like too obvious, right? I mean, it's a. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but he, he, he's not a dark, like, he's a Hufflepuff at heart who wishes he could be, you know, uh, the next Dark Lord, and it's, it's just not happening for him. So, <laughs> it's issues. Jay or Lynette? I, yeah, I think. Go ahead, Lynette. No, oh, you go. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. It's okay. Okay, all right. Um, I think like Alexander, I'm probably a bit of a hobbit, but probably more like Bilbo before the adventure when he just wanted to be away from everyone and just like, you know, like multiple times I just referenced, I'm going in my writing hobbit hole now. So I think I just kind of, I don't think I'd be the adventurous kind of hobbit. So, um, but as for my book for the prison healer, I, I don't know, like I, is, maybe like an orc, like something that's like mm. know, that's terrifically mm. like entrapment kind of like everything's trying to kill you. Um, I don't know. I don't like thinking of it as an orc because um, that's no one wants to think of that book as an orc. Um, <laughs> maybe like so, a dark wizard, like Saruman. Maybe, yeah. I like yeah. that much better. Thank you. Let's go with that. <laughs> okay. I'll come visit you in the Shire. I'll come bring some. Some delicious bread. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to tag along because okay, so I think uh, a lot of 2020 has turned me into more of a hobbit, but no, I think I think I'd have to go with very similar answers. There's a lot of food in Wings of Ebony as well, and that comes from a very <laughs> authentic place. 
<laughs> on a bad day, I want cheesecake. I want to, you know, drown my sorrows in cheese and cream cheese. And then on a good day, I want to reward myself with cheesecake. So it all centers around food. Um, and then, like, I literally do have second breakfast almost every day. Um, I guess my book would be, you know, there. I see a lot of parallels, right? Like, I feel like Rue is very content at home in her hood, just chilling. And then like the world goes left and she's like pulled into this, like, you know, adventure that she has to adventure that she has to go on. I think maybe, maybe I'm, I'm the Hobbit like before the adventure. And then Wings is like the, the Hobbit after the event when they're like required to be drug into this, this situation because they have this sense of, you know, obligation and duty and adventure. So I think we're both Hobbit. When they have to go off the Mordor. So. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> because we're gonna fight relentlessly. So, nice. Yeah, we're gonna fight relentlessly. But we really just want to sit down and eat. Like, can we just yeah. <laughs> in for the war, <laughs> there for the second breakfast? <laughs> um. So, what is your favorite fantasy trope or fairy tale trope? And then, how did you subvert it? Or do you want to talk about? you know, how you subverted that, that trope? Did you bring in something new to the genre? You know, I kind of want to talk about, um, I'm very proud to be a genre writer. And I think that, you know, it's something to celebrate. And I think it's something so specific, you know, especially if you write fantasy and especially if you write for kids. Um, so is there something that, you know, why, why kids, why fantasy? And then how did you bring in something different to the genre? Um, I, think I, think I, I thought a lot about it specifically. Um, I so I know people get tired of it. I don't. Have, first, I'll say I'm really bad at favorites. Like my favorite changes every day. Uh, but I like a lot of things. And, um, I really think people get annoyed and bored with the chosen one trope. And for mm -hmm. me, I'm like, but I'm like a black girl from an inner city community. When 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 am I chosen? When have I ever been chosen in literature? Right. And so I was like, I'm going to take this trope and I'm going to subvert it um, in both the book one and the sequel. And I think that's what you get in Wings of Ebony. You get a girl who, I mean, no spoilers, but you get a girl who a lot of is, is a lot is expected of her. Um, and she's she's not down with it. And she's not down with it for good reason. Um, but then she's pulled into it regardless because of the stakes involved. And so I think it's a it's a um sort of a twist on it. And then in terms of like representation, it, it's you know, very different from what from what we've seen. And so um, that was really important for me to write specifically for kids. Kids like me, I have two little sisters who are 14 and 15 and I have three children. <laughs> um, and so I just, it's important for me for them to have the stories and to be able to see themselves in stories that they weren't able to, that I wasn't able to do growing up and they haven't been able to. Like I want them to understand what it feels like to be the chosen one. I want them to get lost in the pages of a book and be able to picture themselves as the hero and not have to like completely reimagine themselves to do that, to see the things that are nostalgic to them and the things that are that are, that are reminiscent of home down to the food they eat, the ways they speak to each other, the things they enjoy doing. Like I wanted them to be able to like frolic through a novel <laughs> and like feel, feel seen by all of those things. And so, um, it was a really intentional, intentional choice in, in Wings. No, that's awesome. And I, you know, I think I spent my entire childhood not seeing myself in the books that I love. And, you know, it had made me think like, how did I, like, how did I deal with that? You know? And so it always felt like, oh, this is like, I love them, but this is about other people, you know? So, and even just trying to reconcile that, you know, it's, it's interesting. So, yay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would actually love to hear your answer to this question too, because you are so deep into fairy tales with some of your stories. Yeah. Um, so I'm writing a fairy tale uh, series called Never After, and my my favorite and least favorite fairy tale is Cinderella. You know, I just really I I love it and I hate it. <laughs> you know, I love the makeover and then I hate that. That just means she gets to marry the rich guy. Like, who cares? You know, I just, you know, I always wanted Cinderella to like do it on her own. Um, so, and never after, Cinderella is a troll. <laughs> so it's a little, it's a little Shrekky. <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> you know? But uh, you know, I kind of really enjoyed. I enjoyed doing that. <laughs> you know, how about uh, how about you guys? 
<laughs> but like what story is not improved by like mixing it a little bit with Shrek, right? Like yeah, wouldn't Star Wars meets Shrek also be kind of yeah. amazing? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, anybody else? You guys want to talk about this? Should we move on? I can go. I, I always hated the hero who was good at everything. Like, like it really annoyed me that Harry Potter was like supposedly this great wizard, and then he was really good at sports too. Like he was a jock and he was smart. It was just kind of infuriating. Um, so I, I really wanted to write a character who was really just not that good at anything. Like in my book, he he goes on the wrong quest. He just he thinks it's the right quest. It's just the wrong place to go, and there, there's no ring there. Um, it just blew it. Um, so I, I really, I kind of like that character who's just, you know, he's not good at everything because nobody's like yeah. that. Yeah. I and love if that. they are, we really don't Me like too. those people. I think it's so relatable for kids, especially for middle grade, yeah. especially. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in lore, one of my favorite, like one of my evil favorite tropes of Greek mythology and Greek tragedy, especially, is the idea that the more you try to avoid fate, the harder it comes for you, the harder mm -hmm. and faster it comes for you. Um, and so yeah. in this book, I really wanted to kind of address a lot of the misogyny, a lot of the more problematic content that you find in Greek mythology. Um, and I wanted to come at Greek mythology from a very feminist angle, but it was also very important to me to have Lore reject the idea of fates and not, you know, being in control of her own life. So that was like my one, ah, well, there were a couple tropes. I should give myself more credit. There are a couple tropes that I had fun with twisting and turning on their heads, but that one was really important to me. There are many tropes that you did very well in that book. <laughs> many. <Yes. laughs> I'm a fan. <laughs> I feel like um, I, I try to do, you know, a couple of different things with each book, but one one trope that I really don't like all that much in any book that I read is is um, insta-love. And so I always try to, um, I, I don't even know if subvert would be the right word, but I always try and make that not a thing. But in The Prison Healer in particularly, you know, the main character has lived in this, it is a death prison, you go there to die, and she's lived in this place for 10 years, and most people do die within a couple of a couple of weeks, a couple of months. And so when, you know, the love interest for this book does arrive at this prison and is given, you know, the worst kind of labor that anyone could have, you know, the main character, she's had these walls up forever because she knows that people die, <clears throat> excuse me, and she knows not to form attachments because there's no point. Yeah. And so she's constantly pushing this person away and, um, and he's very persistent. But every time she sees him, she's like, how are you still alive? And so like there is, it might be like there's instant attraction, but she's just expecting him to die and she won't cross that boundary because of that and so um i really appreciate books where um especially in the fantasy genre i think i think the reason i mean i love insta love in in some genres i think it's great and i think it's really important but in fantasy it really bugs me if a book is pitched as a fantasy book and then suddenly x meets y their eyes you know attach and then suddenly everything is about dating rather than oh we need to save the world or we have this massive problem or we have whatever the actual fantasy element of it is of and that kind of fizzles out and disappears and it's all about this romance and um and there's definitely a time and place for that and i think it's lovely but i i like books more where you kind of there's that tension before it gets there i feel like uh, you just described my books so i'll just just tag on so like jl i don't really have favorites as such but in the Gilded Ones, there were two sort of uh, tropes. And I'm so sorry, my puppy is in the, is in the ankle biting phase. Oh, okay. no. I, I'm so glad okay. I mentioned the puppy because I saw the furry little head and was like, lift, show us the puppy. <laughs> uh, bring in the puppy. And I don't want to see them right now. Try not to. Show us the puppy. Oh, my <laughs> trying to protect my ankles but um so i two tropes that i sort of wanted to examine in the gilded ones were first um the action girl out. trope um puppy i know so you were telling us the tropes that you didn't like 
Um, well, so no, these were tropes that I'd always been a fan of, um, but I sort of wanted to examine. The first is the action girl. Like I love any movie where there's a woman kicking butt, um, any book, like, but one of the things that I noticed was that they always tend to come out the womb like tough, right? Mm. And I and I really wanted to examine that, um, especially in the context of a patriarchal society, because we have so many books where it's like, um, the girl is in this horrible, oppressive place and she already um, has leveled up. And I wanted to look at what happens before the level up, you know, like I wanted to see the progression to the level up. Um, and so that's why we start with my main character, Deka, believing so deeply in everything that she's taught. And then we see her progression as the book continues. Um, another thing, another trope that I really like um, is girl groups like groups of girls, um, but always, um, except for um, some notable uh, some notable exceptions, there's usually like some backbiting over boys and things of that nature. Um, and like, there's always somebody who's like somebody's enemy or whatever, and there's falling outs and things of that nature. And I really sort of wanted to have like a group of friends that really liked each other, um, but more importantly, were bonded to each other in that like, it's really like if one dies, then there's a likelihood the others are gonna die too. Um, so I just really wanted to examine both of these tropes as I went through the Gilded Ones. That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna go to some of our audience questions because uh, we only have 10 minutes left and I wanna get to some of them. Um, so this is uh, for anybody who wishes to answer, but what uh, is your opinion on the importance of diversity and fantasy? Um, I mean, oh. I think it's really important. So I'm gonna say that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I grew up not reading, uh, I mean, reading books where I was not in them. And, you know, um, it's hard, you know? And I think it's great that it's so awesome now that you can bring so many stories. I just wrote um, a picture book with a Filipino, based on a Filipino myth, and use Filipino Tagalog words in the text, like mm -hmm. as if any, everybody knew them, the, the, this kind of food. So I was just, you know, the fact that we can do that now, I, I think that's great. Okay. okay. Anybody else wanna jump in? Um. I um, I'm so happy that there's more diversity in books now because um, it is painful not seeing yourself. But not only that, it's also sort of dangerous because what happens is when you only consume the stories of other people, then that means that like the space in yourself where you can imagine yourself as a hero shrinks more and more and more. Um, and you can only imagine other people as heroes. Um, and I think also um, and equally importantly, seeing different people as heroes um, allows you to see um, different people as having their own agency. Because I think that's like one of the most insidious things that sort of happens, like um, when we only have books where it's only like um, a white guy as the main character, as the hero, everybody else never gets a, like never gets the chance to be seen as somebody who has agency who has power over their own life their own actions and all of these things so i think it's so important to like allow people that imagination not just um diverse people but everybody else as well yeah absolutely um all right does anybody else want to say okay um okay i thought this was a fun Fun question. What would be your fantasy pet sidekick? <laughs> oh, I want a dragon. Like, I would. I would. <laughs> what? Yes. Yes. 100%. Yeah. We all need a dragon. With, with, with like, really blue flame. Because I saw that in Game of Thrones and I was like, okay, I like the blue. I like the blue. Yeah. <laughs> dragon with blue flame. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> But like one uh, that you can like shrink, the one that shrinks and grows, so you can take it with you wherever you go, rather than just in an outdoor field or when you're flying. I think, you know, the epic <laughs> dragon is amazing, but then it can, if it can shrink down to like Mushu size and kind of hop on your shoulder and just hang with you the rest of the time, like a lovable dog, then I think you've kind of got <laughs> the best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah, I would love to be able to like fit it in a purse time to time, because that could come in. <laughs> yeah. A designer <laughs> dragon purse. 
<laughs> yeah, that'd be oh, that'd be amazing. And incidentally, <laughs> with the gilded ones, there's a character sort of kind of like that. Oh. Oh. Yes. Tell us more. There is a creature uh, in the gilded ones. His name is Ixa. Ixa uh, is a dragon-like, cat-like being of um, indeterminate origin um, that can grow and shrink and change um, and change shapes. That's and cool. uh, that's as far as I'm going to say because I don't want to spoil some things. So, yeah. I, I also had a dragon. He's he's just in the tail in the book there, um, and my <laughs> dragon doesn't. He can't change size, although I really like that. Uh, he just and he can't breathe fire. He just has really bad breath. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is also a very bad weapon. That's so funny. Some dragon slander right there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I would like a horse that could, that like always knew the right direction to go because I have no sense of direction. Mm. So I feel like that would be very useful on a quest. Very type useful. Adventure. <laughs> Can I uh, just uh, like take the horse the time? Because I don't yeah. either. <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we try? You can use my dragon at times, I'll use your horse. Okay. I feel like they'd be friends anyway. So. <laughs> Um, no, Jay's dragon will want to eat your horse, I think. Yeah, it's a dragon. <laughs> yeah, it's be Look, we'll only bring my horse in in baby form around other people. I will oh, yeah. only, well, you know, <laughs> when I need to deal with things in the world and people in the world, then uh, then it will take on its full form and all its fire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I thought this was a cool question, too, because I kind of felt like, you know, we could also talk about what books. Uh, so, what folklore theme is a go-to for you? Like if you see a book with this theme, um, you want to buy it, you want to read it. Like what is your go-to, like, you know, if you see it and you just like, oh, I want to buy that, I want to read that. It's like, there a genre, is there a story? Is there, you know, a fairy tale that just makes you go, or, you know, even an author, like who's like your auto buy, you know? I mean, for a long time for me. Oh, there you go. There's my I have many auto buys, <laughs> but that's the one in arms reach at all times. Uh, see, I I still love secret royalty. That's like my like. You don't know that you were a royal. This happens a lot in um, Greek mythology too, where like you don't know about your divine parent parentage, or you don't know that you were like actually a royal, but you were hidden at birth for your protection. I will read every story that utilizes that trope and never get tired of it. Are you still waiting, Alex, to find out? <laughs> yes. 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 I'm, a, I'm a sucker for mermaids. I'm not going to lie. If I see uh, any type of mermaid looking creature or anything that's underwater, I will buy it. Um, I I just, I really love that trope because growing up in Sierra Leone, I grew up next to a marsh where they said that Mami Wata, who's the goddess of all waters and looks like a mermaid, lived. So ever since, I've just been a super fan of that. That's awesome. <laughs> How are you guys? Lynette? Um, I've been thinking of it because I've kind of been agreeing with everyone as you said things. But one thing that's coming to mind is a really well done and it actually it doesn't matter because i'll just buy it anyway but like like a training like a fantasy training kind of academy so you know like like i think we've all kind of mentioned before that you know we don't love the idea of an instantly an instant warrior and so someone who has to train to get there whether that's through magic or through physical training or you know any kind of just that immersive experience and when it's written well you kind of feel like you're learning along with them and I really you know anything like that I'll just gravitate straight towards it's almost like I want to go back to school but I very much don't <laughs> <laughs> and that, I mean, that works so well with YA too, because so much of YA is the main character discovering who they are in their own inherent power. And so it just always dovetails and works so beautifully in, yeah. our, in our age group. Yeah. Training. What about you, Mike? Um, Where I, you know, <laughs> I'm trained as an architect, so I like, um, I'm just thinking of, I, I really love Susanna Clark's Piranesi. Um, and, uh, I love books about like mysterious cities. Like that book is all about this kind of 
impossible world of architecture and oceans that's hidden in the way. Um, I really enjoyed that. Or even like um, in the subtle knife that Chita got, say that abandoned, I love those abandoned cities um, in build in, in I'm trying to think of the other one. There's one in um, which is the prequel, the Narnia books. There's a great abandoned city where they meet the witch Jadis is, is really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of frozen city, wrinkle in time, great sort of mysterious city where they all come out with the yo-yos. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's a weird I that, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we only have less than a minute. So we can, I wanna close. Uh, how have you survived the pandemic? What was your survival uh, method to get through this year and change? We're more than a year now into it. I will uh, admit how I got through it is I watched 40 seasons of Survivor from my couch, <laughs> which is kind of awful and kind of drove my family crazy. But, you know, these people were so appreciative for every little bit of food that they got. I felt like, why am I complaining? At least I'm not starving on an island to be on a TV show. <laughs> yeah, I bet you picked up some survival skills in case things like really took a turn, too. That's actually a useful show to watch. So how did you guys do Go ahead. No, um, no. I watched baking shows. I've never been into baking shows, but now all of a sudden, Great British Bake Off, Baketopia, like anything with the word bake in it, I am there. <laughs> I actually think I might be a good baker now, except I don't bake. <laughs> but I feel like I can do it. Um, and also, I got a pup, puppy who finally, thank oh. God, is asleep. <laughs> you got a quarantine puppy, and you can bake in your head. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Mine was just playing with my dog nonstop. I think like he, we're already pretty codependent and then this mm -hmm. sort of made it worse. So we'll see how things go once it's time mm -hmm. to like return to the, to society, to the real world. I also did a lot of baking. Uh, sorry. No, I didn't do it. Well, I did a bit of baking, but I watched a lot of baking shows. Um, but I also <laughs> found myself reading a lot of romance books. And I think purely because they were almost always a standalone with a guaranteed happily ever after. And I really needed that headspace of, okay, everything's going to be okay. And, and they, you know, I, you know, with fantasy, especially my fantasy often, a, a book will end on a massive cliff, like cliffhanger and it just brings this anxiety as you wait for the next one. Whereas with romance, I was like, it's going to end well. Everything is good. So baking shows and romance fiction. Very comforting. <laughs> what about you, Jay? Um, I was thinking, you know, the, the pandemic was very transitional for me. Like in my personal life, there was just a lot of stuff happening. So I felt like I didn't really have the opportunity to um, just kind of sit and worry as much as I would have otherwise. Um, but I think it was just staying busy and with the, like being engaged in the present. I think so often, um, especially like when you sell your debut novel, like you're thinking about, oh my goodness, my book is going to come out for so long. Like it's just, it dominates yeah. everything that you're doing and working toward. And so for me, I think um, what I, what I kept busy with was just sort of remembering to like be present. I mean, I have three kids and at the time they were homeschooled and we were moving across country and my partner was changing careers. And like, it was, it was just a lot of change. And I think in some way that was very good because it forced me to mm -hmm. sort of sit in the moment and breathe in the moment. And, and that made me realize that how much I hadn't been doing that. Um, mm. So I think that, and then in addition to that, uh, binge watching reality TV for sure. Um, and spending a lot of time on cheesecake, which is just a running thread in my life. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Mikey, you wanna close us out? <laughs> um, comedy. I, I wrote another one of these goofy books, and that was super fun um, in the pandemic, just making fun of stuff and just not thinking about the sheer horror going on in the world, which it's always going on anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe maybe just escaping into work is what I did. Yay. Um, so I want to thank all of our authors. Please order their books on bluebicycle.com. We have a lot of signed books from them. And I want to thank all of our uh, audience today. We have thousands of people who are watching Y'all West today. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, thanks for, for being here. Now. Thank Yay. you. <laughs>
Good seeing you all. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>